Hello everyone, uh, welcome to Exploring Media Theory. This is lecture 8 and this week we're going to look at feminist theories and we're moving on for some of the theories we covered last week. So as last week we covered liberal feminism and we looked at culture, uh, feminist cultural studies. This week we're moving on to a couple of other theories. We're going to be looking at radical feminism, post-structural feminism and finally we're going to be talking about a topic called post-feminism. And this is the pre-recorded lecture. I'm afraid I have a bit of a cold this week, um, so my voice is a little bit unclear, so I apologise for that. Okay. okay, so the aim of this lecture um, is to look at some of the main claims of the fami uh, radical feminist movement, to consider the debate over the idea of pornography, um, to evaluate the influence of post-structuralism on feminism, uh, consider the debate over post-feminism, and critically validate key uh, assumptions and concepts throughout. So what I'm going to be doing is talking about radical feminism, we're going to be looking at the idea of pornography a bit, uh, looking at post-structural feminism and then post-feminism, and for each one I'm going to be addressing some of the critical concerns as they come up in each area. Okay, so the first one I want to talk about radical feminism. Um, it emerged in the 1960s and 1970s out of a wider countercultural movement that was present in that time. So this countercultural movement arose in opposition to the Vietnam War. It arose in uh, opposition to the attempts by a number of governments to challenge anti-colonialist movements that were going on at that time. So in the 60s and 70s, the, the British Empire had been going for a couple of hundred years and there have been waves and waves of anti-colonial liberationist movements that have been going on all the way through the 20th century and from beforehand. But by the 1960s and 1970s, a number of these movements were coming to fruition and a number of countries were achieving independence and have been since the end of the Second World War. We had India from 1948 all the way through. So the Anglo, sorry, the uh, Francophile Southeast Asia which was Vietnam and Cambodia, were achieving independence. You'd had the Korean War in the 1950s, by the 1960s and into the 1970s, the Vietnam War was going on. There was a lot of civil rights movements occurring in, in, the, in various parts of the West. There was also large parts of Africa were achieving independence. And so the world was changing. The old colonial regimes and the old power structures were breaking down. And Many of these were mirrored in minor in Western countries where older systems of power were also collapsing. So the older, what we might term small C conservatism, the idea that you should continue to do what you did in the past because that was best, that was losing legitimacy. And in its place were more progressive movements, more liberal movements that um, sought to e equal up the balance of things. And part of this, as we noted last week, was the rise of the feminist movement from the early, 20, early part of the 20th century through the first wave, then into the second wave in the 50s, and by the 60s and 70s, these kind of movements are really gaining momentum. And part of the feminist movement, um, perhaps a more radical edge of the feminist movement, gradually evolved into what we term radical feminism. So you could start to see it maybe as more a dynamic edge of the women's movement. Um, and it began to separate itself off a little bit from other forms of feminism. And as I noted last week, however, um, us giving badges to people active in this area is perhaps a little bit disingenuous. We're labelling them after the event, um, and we're looking at them and trying to you know, put cat people into categories. And there was a lot of commonality in interests, but there was also a lot of difference. People thought that maybe women's interests would be best advanced by adopting this way, or maybe best advanced by adopting this way. And what we're doing, we're coming on afterwards and saying, well, the ones that want to do it this way, we'll label them that, and the ones that do it this way, we'll label them that. But they're all broadly after the same thing, which is a, a better sense of equality. So what radical feminism was doing is it was challenging some of the ideas of liberal feminism and some of the ideas of later cultural studies approaches. <coughs> now, one of the ways it did this thing is because it had a different conception of the problem, but also a different conception of the way in which both individuals work, the way in which the human mind works, 
and the way in which men and women work. So I want to kind of draw out some of these differences. One of the key ideas is that radical feminism drew very heavily on psychoanalytic perspectives. It drew upon the works of Sigmund Freud, of Lacan and other psychoanalysts. Now these theories were very popular at the time. They offered a way in which we could try and understand people's individual drives and movements. So psychoanalysis is a, is a theory of psychology that initially comes from Freud and it was moved up by Jung and then Lacan and a number of others. And radical feminism drew on this psychoanalytic approach that was quite popular in the 60s and 70s. To contemporary times, um, not many psychologists would go down a psychoanalytic route, but it's still quite heavily used in various academic disciplines, such as film studies and various branches of literary analysis. So radical feminism makes quite a lot of use of psychoanalytic devices, but it also drew on what we might term biopolitical ways of thinking about people. Um, it looked at the ways in which the human body between men and women was slightly differently, slightly different, or radically different if you listen to the radical feminists, and the way in which this structures their experience of the world is quite different. And it would argue that biology will lead to political action. I'll explain more about that in a moment. Um, one of the key ideas is it sees patriarchy, the domination of society by men over women. Um, and it sort of as, as, a, as patriarchy has been quite independent from other forms of domination such as capitalism. And it said that patriarchy has existed far longer than any form of economic system. And if you go right back into ancient times, you will see men dominating women. And that's the problem. These kind of things can't be solved by merely playing around at the edges with addressing the economic system. You've got to go and address the gender system or the, the sex system, uh, the biological system. So what they would argue is that the patriarchy that we have today is not simply a product of socialisation. And whereas the liberal feminists argue uh, you can address uh, a lot of the issues of patriarchy by addressing the form of socialisation and addressing the representation of women in the media, here they're saying it's far deeper than that. It goes much further than that. And in fact, it goes right back to biology and right back to how the human mind is structured. So, as I said, it's different from liberal feminism. Um, <coughs> they, were, they were arguing that the gender differences in society are not caused by women being badly represented or due to the way in which children are socialised. It's the reason women get treated badly in our society. It's not down to the schools, it's not down to the media or anything like that. It's a much deeper problem. Uh, the problems are not a consequence of social construction. And there are problems between men and women because there are essential differences between them. Now, it also argued that socialist feminism is incorrect. So socialist feminism was also arguing that there's gender inequalities, but the best way to tackle gender inequalities is to look at the economic system. And if we can resolve the issues in the economic system, then the gender differences will collapse in their own way as yeah, as part of our movement towards a better socialist way of thinking. For radical feminists, that's not true. Patriarchy is not a consequence of capitalism. Patriarchy doesn't exist because we have capitalism. Rather, it existed far longer than capitalism. And for some of them, they would argue capitalism exists because of patriarchy. So the problem is not a problem with, um, you know, the driver of history has not been class oppression, but it's been gender oppression. And the best way to understand this is that there are essential differences between men and women. And women's interests do not lie with men. Women will never um, do well while there are still men in charge. So men are essentially antagonistic to women. Men are biologically driven to attack women, biologically driven to, to, to conquer them, um, to use them in a particular way. So this is a radical feminist perspective. Um, it seems quite distinct from other forms of feminism, but as I said earlier, it is part of a general broad movement. So if you imagine sort of like feminism as maybe a continuum, you have this group are quite down on one end, liberal feminism are quite at the other end, 
and they have distinct um, ways of looking at the world that distinguish these particular groups. Now, because of the essential nature of the psychological and biological traits, um, we can't actually simply reform things as liberal feminists would argue. We can't modify society to make it better. Society is broken and it can't be mended. Uh, the only option really is revolution. So they're not saying we can reform things, rather that we have to overturn the entire system. But moreover than that, um, the patriarchy and misogyny that um, are come out of our essential biology, they are reproduced and enhanced through culture and through the media. So the media don't assuage these differences, the media don't mitigate the problems of biology. Uh, rather, what the media do is exacerbate the very problems. And the way this occurs is because as men make most of the media, uh, the media captures the values of men and it reproduces the values of men. So perhaps you can maybe not reform it, but if more women were involved in the production of media, that would go some way towards challenging it. But the trouble is, at the moment, they don't. So all you get in the media is the views of men. Now, occasionally women will get positions of power. And what does the media do? Well, you've got, currently you've got um, Prime Minister, um, it's Theresa May, and we've also got Nicola Sturgeon here. So what does the male do? Well, they have Theresa May and Nicola Sturgeon have a discussion about Brexit. What does the male do? It's all about their legs. Um, when women get into positions of power or even speak out, they're often subject to misogynistic attacks or characterizations. So they're reduced to their sexuality again rather than looking at the arguments they've had. Um, a similar argument so can be made, a similar example is the Gamergate controversy. Um, and I'm not going to go into this because it's too big a topic very much, but basically uh, an accusation was made about a female games designer that she used her sexuality to do things, and there was a whole movement organised online on various forums such as 4chan, Reddit, and a number of other technical forms as well as Twitter where they attacked uh, female games designers they really went for them um, you know they critiqued them about their physique and any kind of feminist agenda was severely uh, attacked in this way so occasionally you will get women in power and what radical feminists is that well as soon as women get in power men will attack them as soon as women gets any kind of position of authority or any kind of equivalency men will attack them. And the way they will attack them, they will reduce them to their sexuality. They will seek to look at them and go, well, she was amazed at Prime Minister. No, well, that's not important. What's really important is how good her legs are. So again, you're reducing women down to their physical characteristics. And what radical feminists would argue is that this can't be helped. This will always happen when you've got men making the media, because the media will only reflect the interests of men. It will never give a full equality. Okay, so I want to give you a couple of examples, um, well not so much examples, but a kind of academic analysis that lends itself to this radical position. So I've got a very famous text, it's Laura Mulvey's The Male Gaze. Um, so it's a film scholar who is strongly influenced by structuralism and psychoanalysis. And you may well have covered this in other parts of your degree, so I'm going to go over it quite quickly. So what Mulvey argues is that films are constructed through a male gaze. Female characters are presented in films to be looked at. So the audience spectator position is masculinized. Our, when we watch a film, the way in which women are presented in there is for a male audience. And even the female audience are forced to take the male perspective on watching a film. We're forced to see the characters represented in a certain way. Well, although she says this, she also goes a bit further with this argument. And she draws upon Freud's work on scopophilia, which is the pleasure of looking. And Freud would argue this is a basic human instinct that's written within us, it's hardwired into us. Now Mulvey argues that the classic realist narrative cinema conventions, um, the way in which cinema sets up shots, the mise-en-scene, the, the lighting offsets, the cinematography, Plus, the way in which you consume cinema, which is sitting in a darkened cinema, foster a voyeuristic 
uh, fantasy about women. It fosters, it puts us in a position where we can only view women in a particular way. And Hollywood, and by extension other media like advertising, constructs scopophilia desires for male voyeurs. So we are forced to adopt this position when we watch cinema because that's the angle of the camera and that's what we see. And then she uses uh, the works of Jacques Lacan, a famous psychoanalyst. And um, Lacan talks about how infants identify with a perfect mirror image. Lacan has a model of how uh, children develop and they go through various stages and develop. And one of these stages is called the mirror stage, where we look at a perfect mirror image to ourselves and seek to build ourselves around that. Now Mulvey argues that the screen offers us the perfect mirror image. Audiences identify themselves with on-screen characters. Um, so when you're watching a film, you identify with the main hero of the piece. And typically that is male. Uh, and it's male characters that do the looking, that do the action in the piece. So we are cast as this male character. So male characters who do the looking are the main controlling figure with whom the specta spectator can identify. So we're watching it, we're going into the film, and we're seeing ourselves as its main character. Um, I want to move on now to the analysis of the ideas of pornography. And this really stems from the work of a theorist called Andrew Dworkin. <coughs> um, and what Dworkin was arguing is that pornography illustrates the nature of patriarchy. Um, and what pornography does, it reproduces male domination. Um, so it is a challenging work this one, but it's worth having a look at. So what she was arguing is that is pornography fosters and reproduces misogyny. Um, so she would say pornography is men hating women or men possessing women. And what pornography does, it articulates this domination of women by men. And uh, when she was writing this, uh, she was seeking to win various civil rights cases in the States um, to challenge the existence of pornography and she was saying one of her famous quotes is uh, pornography is the propaganda and rape is the weapon. So what she was saying is that pornography builds up an image of women and it's a way in which men dominate women. Um, so pornography violates civil rights but also legitimates real male violence and pornography is one of the key mechanisms of male power. So this is talking, just a quote, uh, pornography exists because men despise women, and men despise women because pornography exists. So it's kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy. The pleasure of the male requires the annihilation of a woman's sexual integrity. And the key problem of pornography is that it was it eroticizes, it sexualizes violence and power over women. Um, so it adds another layer. So you've got sexual relations and what pornography does, it adds a layer of domination onto that. So to kind of summarize some of the ideas of radical uh, feminism, uh, patriarchy and misogyny are key concepts here. Patriarchy is the male domination of a society, and misogyny is the hatred of women. Media and popular culture help to reproduce them, but there are underlying causes lying kind of like the essential biological or psychological traits of men and, men and women. And though Mulvey also acknowledges the importance of social culture in film, underneath all these are biological drives that really push it forward. Now, if you want to critique it, however, well, it, it's quite stark in its contrast to social constructionist things. And it doesn't really see a way forward apart from women's separation of the sexes. How can women ever achieve equality whilst men are still there? So you have a kind of um, separatist movement occurring within various streams of radical feminism. We also have a bit of a problem uh, with theories that depend upon essentialist assumptions um, and we tend to critique essentialism in the social science and in the humanities as it, it reduces all human action to, to something else. Uh, it reduces our ability for free will and our ability to critique and engage in it. And if all we are is just 
merely receptacles for our gender or merely vehicles for our biological urges? Or what part does culture play in determining us? Quite a significant part, for, according to most people. But here we're reducing down that um, action as opposed to a kind of structuralist approach. Um, there's also a social and, his and historical con context to this. It, radical feminism was emerging at the times of other forms of liberational activity and it draws very heavily upon some of the narratives of those things. Is it still applicable 40 years later? Uh, is the, does the evidence support them? Um, psychology has moved away from psychoanalytic approaches to new forms of understanding the human brain, yet these theories still utilise quite heavily psycho, uh, psychoanalytic theories that have been disproven in psychology. It's also been quite a lot of change. Um, and, you know, so, so things have moved on. And perhaps uh, an aside as well is there has been some recognition that some women do enjoy pornography as well. I always just say that all you know, anyone who enjoys pornography is kind of problematic and is broken as the radical feminist is here. Well, women who enjoy pornography would say, no, what, what right have you got to tell me that I shouldn't watch this stuff? It's not up to you to do this. Now, although these are problems, they don't really completely validate radical feminist arguments, but they give us some kind of context and way in which we can think about them a little bit. Um, a further line is voiced by Susan Moore, who's a Guardian columnist. Um, and she contributed a chapter called Here's Looking at You in a book called The Female Gaze, edited by Gavin and Marchmont. Or Marchmont. Um, and what she was arguing, well, since um, the first volume was written about the female gaze, there's been, well, it's at least so like, you know, two decades of uh, gay politics and feminist politics and perhaps there is now a space in the media for men to become the objects of the female gaze or at least of the homo homoerotic gaze so men are also presented in a certain way <coughs> and Mulvey's kind of approach to the male gaze it doesn't really give any space for female sexuality it doesn't allow women to say what they like to look at it doesn't offer any privilege I'm not saying women like to look at these particular gentlemen below um, but the way, there is a way in which men are now, um, the, the male body is also displayed. In this. And in fact, Stephen Allen's module on masculinities looks at this as well. It looks at the way in which men are presented in a certain way. So let me move on now to uh, post-structuralism. This is a tricky lot of stuff. And I'm giving you a lot of theory on this course. And I do appreciate it. And there's lots of ways in which you have to adapt and understand the different perspectives. Um, and we've talked in previous lectures about the work of Althusser and the work of Ellie Marx and various other structural theories. And we broached as well on Gramsci's model as well. And what we can kind of see is that Gramsci might be termed a post-structuralist, whereas Althusser is a structuralist. And I'll try and explain this a little bit. So post-structuralism criticizes structural models of power. Um, and post-structuralism, it, it's kind of like structuralism plus. So it's not arguing that structuralism is completely wrong, but it argues that maybe we need to reframe some of the forms of analysis and our understanding of how power operates as opposed to the structural accounts. So it says power does do, just does not exist in formal structures, but is articulated through language. It's language that allows power to operate, as Gramsci noted. And so the, the debate between um, structuralism and post-structuralism, for the purposes of trying to make it a little bit clearer, what I would say is if you think back to the work we did on Althusser, where Althusser talked about uh, specific power structures in society, and then you've got Gramsci's model, where Gramsci was saying power is diffused throughout society, and it's us ourselves that contributes to our own oppression through the language we use and through the way in which uh, we think about culture and our understanding and our policing of each other and ourselves. That's a post-structuralist again. So it's saying power is not imposed upon us, rather power is diffused 
throughout society, but it's the language we use, the language which we think about things, um, does this. And although I am aware this is a very, very crude description of Althusser's Zerb's work and Gramsci's work. But anyway, uh, so here a post-structuralist assumes power is exerted through discourse, through language. Another aspect of post-structuralism is it rejects the idea that we are a fixed individual, that we are somehow created and therefore not subject to change as we go on. Post-structuralism has a different idea about the idea of our own identity and so on. And rather than saying we are made and produced as the Althusserians did, what post-structure says is that we continually re-articulate ourselves. We continually redefine ourselves um, in response to our social situation. You move to a new social setting. You have a core set of beliefs, but you draw upon language and ideas in that new social setting and you re-articulate yourself. You reposition yourself in new networks of meaning. So what post-structuralism is doing is it's completely rejecting any kind of essentializing theory. There is no inherent core to us. Um, they, they reject that idea that there's some biological drive that takes it. So they're a bit like social constructors, but social constructors plus. They're the superversion of social constructivism. They think there's nothing inside us. All we are is woven together bits of discourse, um, a tissue of discursive fragments stitched together. And because we're stitched together, and because there's no real us in there, we've got no unitary self. And it argues that we can only understand ourselves and the social world through the language we use, through our way of representing things, through our understanding of images. So, how does this big idea apply to gender and media? Okay, we can turn to the work of a theorist called Judith Butler, who's an incredibly influential theorist and very, very, very readable and very, very good. Um, and what she talks about is how our understanding of gender is constructed by language. So she says, if one is a woman, then it's surely not all one is. The term fails to be exhaustive not because of a pre-gendered person transcends specific paraphernalia of its gender, but because gender is not always constituted coherently or consistently in different historical contexts, and because of gender intersects with race, rad, racial, class, and ethnic and sexual and regional modalities of discursively constituted identities. Well, that's really, really clear. I'm sure you'll appreciate it. But what she's arguing is that gender isn't a fixed category anymore as anything else is, because language is constantly fluid, language moves around. Gender becomes slippery. If all our identities are constituted by language and not based on some biological or psychological self, um, everything is up for grabs. Things like class become slippery, our ideas of racial things become slippery, because these, these guys are re completely rejecting the idea of essentialism. There's nothing inside us that causes what we are. Instead, what we are is a complete uh, mishmash of language. Anyway, so what she's saying is gender is no longer fixed, but it's slippery and it's performed. And Butler focuses on very much what we call performativity. How do we present our gender? And we present it through language and action. And what she was arguing is that we, can, we, we learn to be a woman, or we learn to be a man, and we learn how to present ourselves in certain ways and therefore we can be a woman by dressing and acting like one there is nothing essential about a woman gender and sex are different things sex is the biological the attributed the ascribed idea um, but what our gender is our social construction our behaviors our modes of communication are purely social and we can learn to act differently we can learn to, we learn to act like a woman or act like a girl. We learn like to act like a man. Because there's these big ideas of masculinity and femininity in our life. And we have to adopt them. So if gender is not essential or natural, but performed, then the norms of gender can be subverted and played with. And what Butler talked about was what she called gender trouble. And here is where those fixed categories of gender 
uh, of male, the traditional way of viewing a man and the traditional way of viewing a woman in postmodern times start to break down a bit. They slip, they move around a bit. People start to play at the edges. Now, mainstream media have historically not offered many opportunities for gender trouble, but perhaps that's changing now, particularly with new forms of digital media. They're not new anymore, they've been going since the 90s. And so you've got films now that look at the idea of transgenderism and things like that. Unfortunately, you've got other forms of media that are very, very conservative and will redress it. So Butler's approach is broadly in line with the assertions made about transgender, that a person's gender identity, expression or performance may be different from their assigned biological sex. Okay, so our gender uh, is not just our biological sex, it's something else of us. And what Butler argues is that that is something that's malleable, something that's changeable, something that moves around. So as a category, trans transgender reflects the range of experiences of people who may be different to the wider socially accepted understanding of the presented version of biological sex. Okay, so a transgender person is someone that feels that their uh, presented gender is different from their biological sex. And Butler would say that yes, this division between the sensual biological sex and uh, manifestation of um, gendered identity is quite distinct and you can have quite a different gendered identity to a biological sex. Now the trouble is there have been advances and challenges of these ideas in the media. So you've got films such as Boy Meets Girl but then you've also got the Daily Mail and you've had just, a, just three headlines from the past week here in the Daily Mail. Let little boys wear tiaras. Church of English issues new advice to combat. They kind of inspire combat there. Transgender bullying for teachers. Transgender lessons for two-year-old. Drag queens drafted into nursery schools to teach children about sexual diversity. And finally, the NHS pressurised our kids to change sex. Transgender backlashes, desperate parents accused, overzealous, and it goes on. Well, it, these are, this is a conservative press challenging um, uh, the idea of transgender, challenging the idea that this, this is quite a, a strong idea that biology does not lead to your gender, and you should refute this somehow. So to give you a, a little summary of uh, post-structuralism, uh, feminist post-structuralism offers a contrast to radical feminism and to cultural studies approaches and also to liberal feminism. It challenges assumptions about nature and gender and about power and structure. And it sees the media and especially the affordances of digital media as a kind of playground. And indeed there was a lot of work in the late 1990s and early 2000s about how digital media and how the forms of um, communication that occur through digital media will allow us to present ourselves differently. And in early forms of textual based communication, people were presenting themselves as man or woman. It didn't really matter what actual physical, biological gender you were, you could present yourselves in this way. And there's a lot of movement in the early 1990s. There's a book called The Second Self, published by a woman called Sherry Turkle, <coughs> who talked about the playground of digital media. She has since recounted many of those assertions. And a lot of evidence now says, well, digital media isn't so free. And we're always tied to our kind of physical characteristics via various forms of data and so on. But anyway, the idea is that new forms of media in the new times and in, in postmodern ages allow us to challenge these ideas a little bit more. Okay, finally I want to go on to the topic of post-feminism. Uh, post-feminism is a, is a big um, category, a big description for a number of different activities. Um, it seeks to differentiate itself from previous forms of feminism and even asserts that traditional feminism is no longer needed. Um, so it looked at some of the criticisms made of liberal feminism, so that it was too white, too straight and middle class, and offered uh, a new 
approach to it. It also challenged the radical feminism by saying radical feminism was too po-faced, um, and it also challenged various other theories by saying it didn't. They, those theories didn't really celebrate women's sexuality, and instead, what post-feminism was doing was uh, seeking empowerment through the celebration of sexuality by dressing as the Spice Girls did, by going to pole dancing classes. And although I don't know if you appreciate it, but pole dancing is basically, or well, is often considered um, a part of the sex industry, but poles were in strip clubs and things, and so they've got pole dancing classes, so you've got women learning to do the activities that occurred in the sex industry. And this, according to the post-feminists, is to be celebrated because it shows women are empowered. Women are taking back ownership of this particular form of their representation. Um, and post-feminism in the late 1990s was encouraged by a number of academic scholars. Naomi Wolf is a very uh, famous academic, theor academic feminist theorist. And she talked about power feminism. Um, she drew upon uh, the representations made by Madonna. And what post-feminism was arguing is that media and popular culture offered spaces for women's empowerment. Women could present themselves in these spaces and become powerful again. And they could articulate their power through their sexuality. Because of that, the old battles, you know, they've been more or less won. Women have now got a lot more equality. We can move on to this age where we've got power again. Critiques of uh, post-feminism, well, it was quite heavily critiqued. Tanya Modelsky in 1991 was talking about feminism without women, how feminism, how these kind of approaches were ignoring them. Tasca and Negra in 2007, their book, Interrogating Feminism. And what they were saying is that feminism was being rebadged, or post-feminism was feminism that was safe for men. Uh, it was an, essentially a, a way in which a certain group of women could not a certain group of women, but a way in which a kind of idea of feminism could be re-articulated that didn't scare men as much. And one of the main criticisms is that post-feminism doesn't really advance women's position, but instead it was a certain group of women, young, predominantly wealthy ones, taking advantage of their predecessors' work and then not helping other women by pulling up the drawbridge. So they took advantage of the advances that have been made by first wave feminists, by second wave feminists, by the liberal feminists, by the cultural feminists, by the radical feminists, and said, great, well, we've got this power now, okay, we don't need to do any more, instead I can start celebrating my sexuality, and I can start doing things again, and I don't have to work so hard to try and further women's equality, and I can take advantage of the things that have gone on. But what it also failed to do was failed to critique um, such as you know, the mechanisms of the, main, of the conventional family and of Hollywood feminism or of images of, of women in the media. And perhaps more recently, as we noted last week, when we need, why do we still need feminism? Well, given some of the reasons such as you've got President Trump in power, you've got more women than ever reporting incidents of sexual crime, and of sexual harassment at work and in other spaces, I would argue yeah, we still need feminism. And I think the idea of moving on to a post-feminist phase, where the battle has been won, I think that may be a little bit premature. And that is where I'm going to stop today, so thank you for watching. Oh no, I'm not. I've only got a couple more slides, in fact. Um, let me go on to Tasca and Negra's uh, interrogation. So post-feminism assumes the pleasures, values and lifestyles associated with an affluent elite are universally shared. So post-feminism evaluates consumption as a strategy for healing those dissatisfactions that might alternatively be understood in terms of social ills and discontents. So post-feminism commodifies feminism and neutralizes it and offers consumption instead of critique. And that's where I'm going to stop now. So thank you very much for watching. I hope you've gained something from this and enjoyed it.